Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff. She's a senior research scientist at uh, MIT. Uh, She works in computer science and artificial intelligence. But we're going to talk about a totally different topic, uh, glyphosate, how the weed killer is uh, destroying our health and our environment. So, Stephanie, thanks for coming. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, tell me about your background. I mean, it sounds very eclectic already. How did you get to where you are? It is quite an interesting journey. Yeah, I started off with, I mean, I have always had a real passion for biology. I just love it. And I just can't get enough of it. And I uh, majored in biology as an undergraduate at MIT. And um, unfortunately, when I started working in the biology lab in graduate school, I found out that I couldn't do that. That part of biology was I was completely incompetent. And so I decided to quit and get into computer science. That's kind of my educational history. Computers were a lot more manageable than trying to grow bugs in in labs and things. So I was just a bit inept in the biology lab. So I don't do any experimental work in biology, but I, um, I moved into computer science and and back in those days, it was a brand new field and, um, got a PhD, uh, in electrical engineering and computer science and then had a long career developing spoken dialogue systems, systems that could engage, allow a computer to engage in conversation with humans, spoken, com- spoken conversation. We were the early, mm. early days of the technology that eventually led to Amazon Echo and the, the iPhone, Siri iPhone, you know, oh, wow. Siri application. So um, that's become commoditized and it's really great to see that uh, it's been a very big success story, that whole field, you know. But I, I kind of got out of that field around about 2007, kind of two reasons. One was that that field was becoming difficult to stay in as a, as a researcher, because once the companies start investing lots of money in developing the technology, it becomes harder for academics to do something cutting edge. You know, it's just too much mm. competition. So I, I needed to do something else. And I was delighted to get back into biology. And I was motivated by my concern about autism because I saw the autism rates were going up every year. The government didn't seem to be too concerned, but I was concerned because when you start projecting the numbers, it looks really bad. And I'm still very concerned about autism. I think it's a bigger problem than COVID-19, actually. And I wanted a lot to of out are. what was, was, yeah, a lot of things are right. I think. And I, uh, <laughs> There's things called like cancer and, you know, autoimmune, know. all kinds of other stuff, but uh, they're all ignored. Right. And COVID-19 is mostly killing people who are already pretty close to being dead anyway, right? A lot of them have a mm. lot of uh, comorbidities that are putting them in nursing homes and things like that, because there's huge numbers of, huge percentages of people who are dying from COVID are in nursing homes. So, uh, you know, it's kind of, and it's interesting that it also kills off proportional to the natural death rate. So, you know, the average age of people who die is quite old. So that's kind of good news because it's, COVID's not really harming the kids, you know? 
which is wonderful. Anyway, that was a big distraction, but a big diversion. But anyway, getting back to the autism, yes, I was very worried about autism. I wanted to figure out what was causing the epidemic. And I started systematically looking at various toxic exposures and looking for things that were also going up in, in prevalence and step with autism. And I looked for five years, starting in 2007, and I learned a lot about autism. I was reading all about, you know, the mechanisms of autism and the various comorbidities. They have a lot of issues with the gut and they have issues with um, minerals and, and shedding sulfate. I mean, all kinds of different metabolic derangements that are associated with autism that I didn't understand. I couldn't figure out why and all of this. I was quite puzzled. And it just happened to be serendipitous that I was at a conference where Professor Don Huber was speaking about glyphosate. For two hours, he had a two hour presentation on glyphosate. I walked into the room not knowing what glyphosate was. This was in 2012. And after hearing his lecture, I became convinced that I had found my answer. It was that clear because he talked about all the things that glyphosate does to affect your health. And they lined up so well with all the things I was seeing were going on with the autistic kids. So I thought this is it. And I, I, I just had an instinct about it. And I went back and started reading everything I could about glyphosate and quickly found out a lot of things that made sense in terms of the autism problem. And so, and also then finding out that the autism rates are going up exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage. That's the, those two curves exactly match over time. So, I mean, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, but it's quite stunning when you see those degrees of co- correlation. And glyphosate does reflect the fact that there's a lot of other chemicals that are also going up dramatically. We've become very chemical happy these days and so and they are synergistically toxic so glyphosate makes a lot of the other ones more toxic than they would otherwise be because it messes up the liver the liver's ability to detoxify them so everything gets much worse you know when, when chemicals are working together we never study them in combination but we see them in combination all the time in the real world so it's quite a mess and we just the amount of, of research that's been done to figure out what these chemicals are doing is way way too little compared to the degree to which they're out there in our environment, we're being extremely reckless with with the use of chemicals, you know, man-made chemicals. And glyphosate, I think, is the primary example of that. So what are some of the things in that uh, lecture or in general that jumped out at you to tell you that uh, there was a, a likely connection between glyphosate and autism? Yes. And so uh, he's an expert on plant pathology and plant physiology. And he observed that glyphosate disrupted the uptake of minerals into the plants. And he showed slides where he showed tremendous drops in uh, critical micronutrients like manganese and zinc and iron, cobalt and sulfur. These were all much lower in the plants when they were exposed to glyphosate because they were getting disrupted in their ability to take up those minerals. Glyphosate is a really good mineral chelator. So it binds to them very strongly and prevents them from getting distributed. And that, if, and then he said that would happen in the human gut as well, that the, that would, the glyphosate would bind to the minerals and, and interfere with their use by the microbiome, by the microbes in our gut. For example, uh, lateral bacillus depends critically on manganese. Manganese gets severely depleted by virtue of glyphosate's presence. And that was shown in a study on cows where they found they were looking at all the minerals and their levels in the blood, and they found two that stood out, manganese and cobalt, that were in a bunch of cows, eight different farms in Denmark, and all the cows and all the farms had very low levels of manganese and cobalt in their blood. Cobalt is a critical uh, a catalyst for cobalamin, and cobalamin is a really important B vitamin. So that's going to end cobalamin deficiency is linked to autism. And then there's issues with iron. It, glyphosate disrupts the, the system that distributes manganese and iron throughout the body. You get simultaneous toxicity and deficiency at the same time because of glyph- the degree to which glyphosate messes up the whole mechanism by which the body distributes and delivers and uses these these micronutrients. So it's really quite interesting, but there's a lot of problems with the minerals that occur in autism. That's been shown. And then that's connected to glyphosate disrupting those the use of those minerals in the gut microbiome as well as throughout the body. And um, glyphosate um, kills off the gut bacteria. And this is another thing he talked about. He saw it in the soil first. The soil bacteria were getting disrupted by glyphosate. You're getting imbalances of the microbes in the soil with increased uh, pathogen, you know, pathogens overgrowing because the natural beneficial bacteria being killed off by glyphosate. And that same thing happens in the gut. And in fact, a study um, has shown that, that the gut, uh, that the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are two microbes that get really badly hurt by glyphosate, whereas other pathogenic species like salmonella and um, clostridia, they thrive. They're much less sensitive to glyphosate. And also the yeast are much less sensitive than the the bacteria. So you get a, a general loss of bacteria and an overgrowth of yeast. So that's a yeast imbalance. 
And then you get these candida infections that we're seeing. So there's really quite a, a mess up of the, of the microbiome, but there's also a complete mess up of the sulfur system. And that's one thing that you mentioned my book, Toxic Legacy, right? Did you? I forgot. But okay. <laughs> okay. I'll say it anyway. I published this book called Toxic Legacy. You did. You did. How the weed killer glyphosate is destroying our health and the environment. Just released July 1st, Chelsea Green. So um, in my book, I talk about, I have a whole chapter on the gut and it's quite interesting to see how how strongly glyphosate disrupts the gut, not just messing up the bacteria and the, and the, and the yeast, but also messing up the pH so that the gut, the gut becomes too basic. And, and the pH is also critical for uh, the bacteria to produce the appropriate adequate amounts of these um, short chain fatty acids. They're very tiny fatty acids that are produced by the gut microbes by breaking down roughage, this sort of um, stuff that we eat that we can't actually, our cells can't break it down, but these bacteria in your gut can. And they turn it into extremely valuable nutrients, which are these short chain fatty acids. And those get all messed up by glyphosate uh, in part because of this disruption of the pH, uh, which is the acid base balance. Yeah, when you said pH of the gut changes and it becomes more basic. So the stomach is, you know, very low pH uh, versus, let's say, other parts of the gut. So how are all the different parts of the gut affected? Are they all equally turned more basic or varying degrees? Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. That's a good question, and I don't actually know the answer, but I would guess so. Um, Certainly the lower gut may be impacted more than the the, um, stomach. I'm not sure of that. I mean, the stomach gets messed up too by glyphosate, obviously. And, um, and, well, I and guess if, you, um, if you suppress some of the stomach acid, then things wouldn't digest as well or as much. That's and then right. they continue through. And then, you know, from there, you don't have the benefit of as much acid to begin with. Then on, on, on. So. Right. And in fact, I think those acid reflux drugs actually suppress stomach acid, which is causing a problem in the long run. And, yeah. but the, when it, and also the proteins don't get broken down adequately. That's another thing. Glyphosate disrupts the enzymes that break down the proteins. And so the, the proteins accumulate in the lower gut and then the, the, the microbes there break them down into amino acids that can no longer be absorbed because it's past the, the, mid, the mid gut is where everything gets absorbed. So those amino acids actually get broken down further. And you lose the amino acids and you produce nitrogen. So you get ammonia and, um, and then you, the ammonia has a really high pH. So you get uh, I think a lot of the problem is too much ammonia in the gut as a consequence of the microbes metabolizing the proteins that did not get digested earlier. They should have gotten digested in the mid gut, you know, and they didn't. And you get this uh, SIBO, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a common problem these days associated with autism. And that is, again, a consequence of the uh, disruption of the, of the gut. It actually messes up the peristalsis. So it prevents the, it, it doesn't, it, it interferes with the flow of food through the gut and you end up with constipation. We have an epidemic in constipation. Actually, that's another condition that's going up in step with glyphosate usage uh, that the, uh, the, the peristalsis doesn't work. The contractile muscles get broken. Contractile proteins get broken. Has anyone been able to develop a, a device or a little test that you can, you know, test like let's say fruits and vegetables or other, you know, if you're about to sit down and eat food? Right. I don't know. It would be nice if they had like little test strips to test for the presence of glyphosate in the level. It would be so awesome. And actually, I've been contacted by various people who are working on exactly that kind of technology, trying to develop something like even that you could just. I just would love. I love this concept, and I really hope it comes because there are people who are trying to make that happen. And of course, there's an issue of cost. If they want to provide some kind of a tool, I think even that you could just sort of install with your phone and you could sort of shine your phone on the Cheerios box 
and it could return back, you know, some kind of measure of whether there's glyphosate in there, which would be really fantastic. I can picture people going to the grocery store and, and zapping the apples and the, you know, and the wine bottles and trying to see how much glyphosate there is. And if it comes out positive, they don't buy it. That would be so cool. I think it's a possibility that that could come. And um, you can test glyphosate in food, but it's not easy for regular people to do that. And it costs a lot of money right now. So, uh, and you, you know, you can get glyphosate in your urine tested or in your water supply. And that's something you can do for about a hundred dollars, I think. And there's uh, services on the web that allow you to do that. And many, many people are testing positive for glyphosate in their urine. And in fact, there's correlations with disease. There was an interesting study that I talk about in my book where they took people who had fatty liver disease. That's one of the diseases that's going up dramatically in step with glyphosate usage. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And the people who had fatty liver disease had, they measured glyphosate in the urine. They had statistically significantly more glyphosate in the urine than ones who were healthy. And even among the people with the disease, they could separate them into less disease, more disease, and find, again, a statistically significant difference in the amount of glyphosate in the urine. So that really pretty strongly points to glyphosate. A study on rats showed that even when they were exposed to glyphosate below regulatory limits at very low levels, they developed fatty liver disease. So that's one I think that's quite clear. People should start opening up lawsuits against glyphosate for fatty liver disease caused against Monsanto for or Bayer for, gly, for glyphosate causing fatty liver disease, I think. You know, they've been very successful with these lawsuits on, on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's another one that yeah. glyphosate causes. Has anyone been able to collate a list of the foods that have the highest levels to begin with? And then when you process, when you eat a processed food, let's say that contains soy, that contains, I don't know, five or six other things, then I think you would get you know, far more glyphosate than, than just eating the original foods that were treated with it. Right. That's a good point. I think that the processed foods in general have higher levels of glyphosate than the more natural unprocessed whole foods, which I always advocate that people eat whole foods and that they buy certified organic whenever they can. Really look for that certified organic label because that can make a big difference. There's a book out called Toxic, let's see, Toxic Foods of North America. I think it's something like that. Uh, it, um, Tony Mitra is the author of this book. And it, it's a, a consequence as a result of his harassing the government of Canada for many years to finally get them to test foods for glyphosate. And the, and the Canadian government tested thousands of different foods. I have to say the U.S. government thinks glyphosate is perfectly safe. They know it's all over the food supply. They don't care. They don't bother to test. I mean, it's pretty sad when you have a chemical that's the most used herbicide on the planet and the United States uses more per person than any other country in the world. And we don't bother to test how much is in our food. I think that's a very sad statement of our government's irresponsibility in regulating toxic exposures. Yeah, I, I found the book, by the way, just that's uh, Poison Foods of Poison, North America. Poison, that's right. Poison Foods. I knew that toxic wasn't quite right. It was getting me in trouble with the rest of it. Thank you. Poison Foods of North America. <laughs> Yes, and he well, has at least, all the numbers. At least, uh, even if they don't do right by us with glyphosate, at least with uh, with COVID, they're doing right, and they're not censoring anything, and they're, they're promoting <laughs> health. And, I mean, uh, they're. I know you were joking. I get so angry at them because they never say, "Just get out in the sunlight, get some vitamin D," you know, eat ho- eat whole foods, eat, eat eat healthy foods, don't eat processed foods, and eat um, you know, organic foods. I mean, I wish they would be saying that. They're so ridiculous not to. And I will tell you that. Our country has 4% of the world's population, 16% of the deaths from COVID. So we're four times as likely to die in America as the average. And we have 19% of the world's total glyphosate. We use 19% of the world's total glyphosate, which is pretty close to the 16%. I think the glyphosate is a huge factor in COVID-19. And when you look around the world at the countries that are pretty much immune to COVID-19, those are the countries that mostly eat small family farm foods, you know, organic, wholesome foods. The ones who are loaded up on processed foods that are loaded up with glyphosate, they're getting sick. I really think glyphosate is a causal factor, not the only cause, I always have to say, but a causal factor in the in the nightmare that we've been having in the United States with respect to gaining control over this bug. Has anyone uh, established uh, immediate, like acute effects of eating a meal with glyphosate in it, or does it take much longer than that and it's too subtle? Well, that is an excellent question. And that is part of the problem with glyphosate is that it's low kill. And I write about that in my book. I, I talk at great length about it's what I think is its most um, damaging mechanism of toxicity, which is very subtle and long lasting and cumulative. So very, very dangerous. It, it sticks around and gets stuck into your proteins. Basically, it substitutes for glycine. 
this is a, a hypothesis, but I almost I'm very confident that I'm right. And I write about my evidence to support it in my book. It's pretending to be glycine and glycine is an amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid, one of the building blocks of the proteins. Glyphosate fools the system and the system thinks it has a glycine molecule and it puts it into the protein and it's the wrong thing, it has this extra stuff stuck on the nitrogen atom that messes everything up. So certain proteins get really, really hurt when they end up with a glyphosate in an odd spot. It messes up their ability to do their job and they can become toxic. And that alone can explain a great deal of the diseases that we see. There's so many diseases that are going up dramatically. And one of them is obesity. And we see diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's, autism, all these diseases and various cancers, pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer. These diseases are all going up dramatically, exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage. And people just laugh at that. How could one chemical cause so many diseases? I am saying one chemical is causing so many diseases. And about, that about cyanide, yeah. no one would say is, uh, you know, it's not going to hurt anyone. Cyanide, C-Y-A-N-I-D-E, right? Cyanide? Yeah, when you said, how could one chemical cause so much problems? Right. Said, well, what about cyanide? True. I know. I know. There are certainly things that can cause tons of problems. That's not, you know, impossible. But because of glyphosate's unique uh, mechanism, it gets it gets into everything and causes all these exotic things because it's uh, messing up individual proteins. And I can find, I can give you the list of the proteins that are linked to the various diseases that can be predicted to be affected badly by glyphosate. So that's kind of a giant jigsaw puzzle that I worked out and talked about in my book. I have chapters on the different diseases and I talk about the specific proteins that I, I believe are getting affected by glyphosate so as to disrupt um, the function. And a good example is fatty liver disease because there's a specific enzyme in the liver called PEPCK, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase, kind of a mouthful, but that enzyme is super important in the liver for converting other um, nutrients into glucose. It's a, it's a, for gluconeogenesis, which is, means that you're going to generate glucose in situations where the blood, blood glucose has dropped down to a low value. If the glucose in the blood gets too low, you go into a coma because your brain critically depends on glucose to keep itself going. So the body responds in a, to an emergency situation. Like if you've been exercising, you didn't, didn't eat, and your, your glucose is dropping. Your body panics and has to produce glucose from, through this enzyme. And the enzyme gets broken by glyphosate. So what happens is that you could go into a coma, which is what's happening to babies that are being born in this, with this situation. Or you can just raise the set point for glucose in the blood. So you always maintain extra glucose all the time it, for the eventuality that the glucose is going to drop too low and you won't be able to, to boost it up again fast enough because that enzyme is broken. That's how you get this sort of precursor to diabetes, which is this, you know, just elevated blood sugar pre-diabetes condition. What's, um... What happens if I'm an organic farmer and my farm is, I don't know, maybe a couple of miles away from traditional farms and the stuff blows over onto my stuff? And even though I label it organic, I do my best. Like I either fail inspections or it gets into the grocery store and people buy it thinking it's all good, but it has glyphosate in it. No, that's absolutely true. And that's really unfortunate that many of them, in fact, I mentioned the Canada, I didn't tell you which foods and I should tell you about that because that's very useful information for people when they're shopping. I'll get to that in a moment, but the, um, the many of the organic foods tested positive for glyphosate in those in all those thousands of foods that Canada tested. But in general, many of them didn't. Many of them tested negative, and the ones that tested positive had much lower levels than their counterpart in the non-organic sector. The ones that had super high levels were non-organic. Um, you'd be surprised legumes like chickpeas and garbanzo beans, so hummus, for example. Those are very dangerous foods, extremely high levels of glyphosate, and they're not GMO. So if you see a non-GMO label, that's not good enough. Those foods are non-GMO loaded with glyphosate, and that's because the farmers are spraying them right before the harvest as a desiccant. And that's a routine thing practice now in many places, for not for the legumes, but also for oats and for wheat and for barley and for sugarcane. All of those food, food crops are being sprayed right before harvest. And that's so stupid because that's when you get the highest levels in showing up in the food. The, the GMO crops, they're spraying them throughout the year to kill the weeds. But in this case, they're spraying it to kill the crop. Is there a known interaction between GMO and glyphosate or just uh, glyphosate on its own? Definitely, because most of the GMOs, actually the majority of the GMOs are engineered to resist glyphosate. There's a particular enzyme called EPSP synthase in the shikimate pathway that glyphosate 
famously disrupts. That's kind of the key. They think that's the key way in which it kills plants. It kills all plants, by the way, except for those that have been engineered to resist it by getting inserted into their genome a bacterial gene that's a special version of that enzyme that's not sensitive to glyphosate. That's how they're protected. And then once you have those GMO crops, you can just spray that glyphosate from the airplane and not worry about it hitting crop. Otherwise, you have to be very careful to just spray the weeds and avoid the crop or else you'll kill the crop too. So this is what's just made agriculture. It's been a real boon for agriculture. It caused our price of food to go down, I'm sure, when they first introduced this. This was around late 1990s. They introduced um, GMO um, corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, and cotton. All of those crops have a GMO glyphosate-resistant version that's extremely popular in this country. The majority of the, of the crops are are GMO engineered to resist glyphosate. And the use of glyphosate went up dramatically after that those crops were introduced. That's where you see the exponential rise in the use of glyphosate from about 2000 up until 2010 and beyond. It's sort of harder to get data after 2010, unfortunately. But the trend was really dramatically upward after they introduced these crops. You said it's in cotton. If someone wears GMO clothing, you know, know. GMO cotton, what, does that do anything to them? Is there I, any that is an skin? excellent question. And I have been suspecting that for some time now. It's not something I mention too often, but I am aware of an epidemic in eczema right now among the kids uh, in this country. We have a lot of kids suffering from eczema. And my suspicion is that the glyphosate in the cotton clothing could be irritating their skin to cause the eczema. It, like glyphosate was found in tampons, which I shudder to think about the idea of glyphosate in tampons when you think how they're used. And also in cotton gauze, sterile cotton gauze had glyphosate in it. So there's presumably got in a, so you think of diapers, you know, so ba- basically glyphosate close to the, to the skin of, of children is, um, is problematic. So I think, you know, we need to have a booming industry in, in organic clothing. There are some organic clothes you can buy. And I, we have bought organic clothes for our infant grandchildren <laughs> so to try to keep them healthy. Yeah, no, that's good. This is, that's, it's just crazy how pervasive. What Are there estimates on the average body burden of glyphosate in people in the U.S.? No, I don't think so. And in fact, it's really hard to measure. One of the issues is how much does it accumulate in the body? And that's one of the things where Monsanto misled us. They had done their own studies and they had shown that it accumulates. This is something I talk about in the book. Very interesting early studies by Monsanto, unpublished. Um, my, my co-author on some papers got them through um, the FOIA, through the Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act. He got these studies from Monsanto and he read them and he shared them with me. And they exposed, um, there was one in particular that was very striking because they exposed bluegill sun fish to glyphosate that was radio labeled so they could trace the radio label and then they looked at the tissues and they found basically radio label in all the tissues and then they measured for glyphosate and they came up short so that the, only about 20 percent of the radio label could be accounted for as glyphosate when they measured for glyphosate then they said hmm i wonder what happened to it what is it you know did it break down what what is it that it is now if it's not glyphosate they said well let's just add some enzymes that break proteins down into individual amino acids and we'll try again when they did that, the yield increased to 80%. So 80% of the radio label could then be accounted for as glyphosate after they broke the proteins down. And they wrote perhaps the glyphosate was incorporated into the protein. This is something that I hang on to because that's what I'm saying in my book. Glyphosate is getting incorporated into proteins and it's hiding. If it's in the protein and not broken apart, you won't see it by the methods that they use. It has to be free glyphosate so it can get hidden. And you can measure glyphosate in milk, for example, and you cannot realize that it's there. Unless you break down the proteins in the milk, you won't see it. So when someone first starts consuming it, has anyone looked at what the immediate effects are versus more long term? And like you said, it, it affects certain proteins. So which body processes are most vulnerable, it appears? Right. I think the first thing you're going to see is gut this disruption of a gut microbiome and disrupt, disruption of digestion. So you're going to start to have constipation problems and probably bloating gas, you know, because the microbes are not doing their job properly to turn gut gases back into organic matter. So you get bloating from um, methane and, and hydrogen sulfide gases that are building up in your gut. You get gut pain and diarrhea and constipation back and forth. That's what the autistic kids do. They, they have a back and forth constipation and diarrhea. They'll go for days without going. And then all of a sudden they'll, they'll have bloating, you know, and they'll have diarrhea. It's quite, you know, difficult, but the, the gut is just not working well at all. And you can definitely recognize that quite easily. Um, I think you'll also get, for example, frequent urinary tract infections, kinds of things. So these are indicators of, of problems with your gut microbiome. 
And I think the gut microbiome is central to your health. You need to fix your gut before you can fix the rest of your body. People need to focus on that. And I recommend, by the way, fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is these complex organic uh, molecules in the soil. And a lot of people have said that the fulvic acid is useful for um, binding glyphosate and removing it from the gut. So a lot, a lot of there's products out that are based on fulvic acid. I had heard the um, uh, glycine too. If you supplement with it a bit, it also yes. helps displace it. That makes sense, right? Because if you've got a lot of gly- glycine lying around, you're m- much less likely to pull in glyphosate by mistake when you make a protein. But there's, you know, there's all these diseases that show up slowly over time that are correlated with glyphosate. Al- Al- Alzheimer's is, a, is an example. And Alzheimer's is based on these misfolded proteins in the in the brain. And, and those proteins are quite interesting because they have sequence. There's a particular sequence in the amyloid beta, which is the protein that misfolds in association with Alzheimer's disease. It has a, a, a particular se- sequence that has a pattern of GXXXG, XXXG, which is three glycines equally spaced with wildcard amino acids. Those three glycines, if you replace them with, with glyphosate, you're going to cause this protein to misfold. It normally would form an alpha helix, but when you put the glyphosate in there, it's going to turn into a beta sheet and it's going to cause, it's basically a prion-like fibril that accumulates and eventually becomes all this plaque that shows up with Alzheimer's disease. So I think glyphosate is substituting for glycine in amyloid beta as a step towards Alzheimer's disease. And it happens slowly over time. You know, you're gradually getting more and more glyphosate into your brain. And it's going into different proteins, and each of those is having different effects. So it's a really complicated situation. And at some point, you you reach a break point where your your brain just can't handle the load anymore, and it starts to uh, change policy, shutting down the neurons, and you start to see and the cognitive defects. Has anyone uh, done a study to characterize the you know the predominant minor species in the gut microbiome of people that have you know varying glyphosate loads? Certainly, bifidobacteria are being disrupted. In fact, low bifidobacteria is associated with a lot of different diseases, and including uh, uh, autism. And uh, bifidobacteria is extremely sensitive to to glyphosate. Oh, okay, so, but the other there's no other signals that are known yet, like you know. I don't no, know, there's lots and that. lots of signals. Actually, I spent a huge oh. long time reading papers about the gut. I don't know if you've looked at any of them. They're like so overwhelming because they, you know, there's so many microbes and um, and there's so many uh, different ways they can be, and each individual has their own personalized microbiome and various ways in which things are disrupted. One of the things is butyrate, in, insufficient butyrate, and also acetate. Uh, it, it disrupts the um, Glyphosate disrupts, I mentioned the short-chain fatty acids. Those two are short-chain fatty acids. Propionate is the third one. And propionate becomes high and acetate and butyrate become low in the gut in response to glyphosate. That's part of the pH change too, because the butyrate needs the low pH. So when the pH gets too high, the basic gut, um, acetate and butyrate get um, lower and propionate gets higher. And propionate excess is actually linked to autism. So that's all these things come back to autism. Many of them come back to autism. There's papers that talk about propionate as a causal factor in autism, excess propionate. So that's an imbalance of the um, short chain fatty acids that are being produced by the microbes in the lower gut as a consequence of glyphosate poisoning. So what happens to uh, autistic, you know, people that uh, are, now, are put on a you know low or no glyphosate diet if it's possible? I think it's going to be vast improvements. And in fact, I don't know if you know Zen Honeycutt. Zen Honeycutt is the founder of the organization called Moms Across America. She's a friend of mine. She's really awesome. And oh, she's had quite a journey. Yeah, you should definitely interview her. She's she's lovely. She's a young mother. She's got three boys, three sons. And um, she was in California uh, in the beginning. She has recently moved to, I think it's Georgia. And she's bought a, a piece of land and she's she's working. You know, she's growing food. She's like trying to become an organic farmer, really moving towards that goal. And I think that's such a beautiful message. She her one of her sons was diagnosed with autistic symptoms and she got concerned. They also had other issues, other health issues. She put the whole family on an organic diet and she was amazed at how much how quickly everything improved. In fact, she's part of a, a movie. Secret Ingredients. There's a movie called Secret Ingredients. It's a documentary. It's a nice movie, actually. It's kind of, it tells the story of another family. And, and Zen is showcased in that movie as well. But there's a family with, again, with small children. And, and the son was having, you showed pictures of him at two years old with his big belly because he was all this gas, you know. And the mother was getting very sick. The father, they all had health issues. And the story just tracked them. Actually, the person who was filming moved in with them and lived with them for, for a long time and, 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 and tracked you know, progress. And, and all the members of the family got a lot healthier. And the only change they made was to switch the entire family to an organic diet. I think you will have remarkable 
people will find uh, amazing things that will disappear because of switching to an organic diet. Things that they thought they were stuck with for life, irritating things like urinary tract infections, you know. I want to say polycystic ovary syndrome. That is an issue. Polycystic ovary syndrome is a very common problem in um, women today. And that's, and I have, there's an interesting story about that related to glyphosate as well, because there's a brand new paper that just came out recently, like in the last year. And they looked at girl babies. Apparently girl babies have a signature marker you can use to figure out if they've been exposed to too much testosterone in utero. And it has to do with the distance. You know, the, it's called the anogenital distance. And you can imagine what that is. And if it's too big, it's an indicator of excess tox, excess exposure to testosterone in utero. And excess exposure to testosterone in utero is also linked to autism. And that condition, that, that lengthened, uh, that defect in their in their uh, development is a pre is a very high risk factor for PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome. So people who have that problem have a much greater increase to PCOS. PCOS is something like twenty percent of the population of women, and it's a and it's a severe factor in um, infertility. So that well, the primary the co- most common cause of infertility is PCOS. It disrupts your um, cycle, menstrual yeah. cycle. And that's all. Much, uh, uh, and so the glyphosate, I wanted to say the glyphosate exposure in utero, these people, they measured the glyphosate levels in the urine of the mother while she was pregnant. And they correlated that with this anogenital distance problem so that they were showing that the glyphosate was uh, you know, at least associated with more glyphosate was, was statistically significantly associated with a longer distance, which meant excess testosterone exposure. And that's easily under- explained because testosterone is converted to estrogen by an enzyme called aromatase. And that enzyme is a member of a class of enzymes called cytochrome P450 enzymes. And that entire class is suppressed by glyphosate. So the aromatase is not working right during development. And and you get too much testosterone in the brain and too little estrogen. And that's all been linked to autism and also to glyphosate through this suppression of aromatase. Yeah, I mean, what's what's the typical split of autism in uh, boys versus girls? Fourfold. uh, Yeah, fourfold more uh, autism in boys than in girls. So, so it's very this, much a boy problem. Does this make problem. sense? Would it make sense in this context, even though it, affects- it would? Because I think the girls naturally have more estrogen, and estrogen is very protective of the brain. So I think that there's an estrogen insufficiency problem during a development, particularly in utero, but also even after they're born, because they continue to get exposed to glyphosate after they're born, and it it causes um, this imbalance of the um, estrogen testosterone ratio. Whereas the girls already have a lot more estrogen than the boys naturally, so they don't get hit as hard as the boys do, but they do end up with this infertility problem as a consequence of the of the exposure. So the boys get autism, the girls get infertility. How much is uh, infertility increased in women that have uh, PCOS? It's been increasing a lot. You know, we've got really infertility clinics are really thriving these days. So many people, it's amazing how many kids are born through in, in vitro fertilization. I have a whole chapter in my book on the reproductive system. I don't know what's what's ahead for glyphosate. I mean, is there any research that uh, is going on to look into it or is it uh, just not funded or like what does the state of you know scientific inquiry look like into it good question and actually things are getting much better i think lately i think for a long time people weren't really studying it toxicologists didn't think it was worth their time to study a chemical that's perfectly safe so they didn't they just didn't do it and of course monsanto discourages people from studying it it was supposedly already proven to be safe some time ago so just don't worry about it but now after a study in 2012 by sarah Lini and his team in france that study showed that low dose glyphosate over the course of the entire lifespan had serious consequences to rats. And that was a big splash. And in fact, the industry managed to pressure the journal to retract the paper. And then the paper got republished in another journal. So it's still valid, the paper that they wrote. And it was that was the first paper I read when I first after I listened to the talk that I mentioned earlier by Professor Don Huber. And that paper really blew my mind because it was showing that it's a it's a very it's a slow kill. They, they said after three months, there wasn't really any obvious problem with the rats that were exposed. But by four months, they started to show, show problems. And by the end of their lifespan, they had uh, liver disease, kidney disease, reproductive issues in both the males and the females, massive mammary tumors in the females. So they had a lot of problems that showed up slowly over time. And that one then triggered people to start looking at low-dose glyphosate. And especially in the last few years, there have been an amazing number of papers that have come out. And most of them are looking at extremely low doses, whereas before 2012, they were kind of overloading. They would do experiments where they would put too much glyphosate. Glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor, and endocrine disruptors are more toxic at, at low levels. It's very surprising. 
Whereas Monsanto had ruled back when they did the evaluations, they said, if you don't see toxicity at the higher le- level, you don't have to look at the lower level. They probably wrote that rule because they understood that if they did look, they would find damage. They probably did an experiment and thought, whoops, you better not talk about that one. You know, let's just change the rules. So the, they didn't The dose realize. makes the poison. And only yes. if it's a high, high dose. That's the, that's the quote. The dose makes the po- poison. And so if you, and they established this rule that if you didn't see toxicity at the higher level, you didn't have to look. But it, they had experiments where it was showing more toxicity when you used the really low dose than the higher dose. And that is classic feature of endocrine disruptors. And, and actually there was a recent paper, a nice review paper, I think 2019, 2020, that had a lot of references and, and was arguing all the evidence that shows that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. So it has that property of um, more toxic at low doses. So lots of papers are coming out recently. And I also want to say Mexico is, has decided, I don't know if you've heard this, Mexico has decided to ban glyphosate. They're going to oh, completely disallow it by 2024. That's I was going to say, why so, why so slow? But, you know, I know. I know. It takes time, right? Because the farmers don't know how to live without it. That's the problem. We need to. And that's the other research that's happening that I'm very excited about, which is learning how to grow food without using toxic chemicals. You know, you don't want to just replace glyphosate with atrazine or 2,4-D because those are also very toxic. You want to get rid of herbicides altogether, I think. We have to decide herbicides are not worth it. You know, you should never use a toxic chemical on something you're going to put in your mouth. It seems logical to me, you know. We're just happy well, people, to poison ourselves. Yeah, people have been told, oh, it's okay. It's been researched, don't worry. And so that's why, you know, it's, even if it's logical, if uh, the powers that be tell you don't worry, then people don't worry. People believe in in the, the fact, they, they think the government's actually looking after their well-being. And they have to realize that that's not true. The government is looking after the well-being of the chemical industry. They don't care if we're sick. That's all I can conclude. And it makes me very angry with this autism situation because this is going to be really derail. It's going to derail us in so many ways, and certainly economically. All these autistic kids are going to grow up and they won't be able to support themselves. Not only will they not work and do contribute to society, but they're going to be a burden in the sense that somebody's going to have to spend full time taking care of them. Yeah. On top of all the new New autistic kids that are coming out every day. It's going to be a nightmare. We've got such a huge burden of medical expenses right now. You know, our country can't figure out how to pay for all the medical needs of all of our population. We are so sick. We need to recognize if we can just eat healthy food and we'll also solve the COVID-19 problem. I mean, what's not to like about that? You know, switch to healthy food. It's like, should be the, it should be a national emergency to say well, think, the government should be it. taking tremendous action to get those organic farms going, you know? I've heard from, I mean, I'm sure you have more than me. I've heard from, from many medical professionals, oh, food, food doesn't really have much bearing on, on X, Y, Z. I know. So it's I, so shocking. I, well, I thought to myself, okay, so, you know, let's say you live to be 90 or something or 80. What's the only thing keeping you alive for 80 years? Food, water, and, you know, maybe sunlight, stuff that comes to sunlight. your skin. Sunlight. <laughs> but, but that doesn't matter at all for, for your health, right? I know. But, yeah, it's that's so the only amazing. thing that keeps you alive. Yeah, they roll their eyes when you say, well, I'm eating certified organic. And they, they kind of roll their eyes. The doctor like, well, that's probably a waste of money. <laughs> the doctors seem to be the last to know. And so I, I don't understand that. I mean, the whole pharma thing. I think pharma is quite delighted to have a sick because they just want to keep us taking drugs all the time. Right. Give them some kind of lifestyle drug that you have to take every day. That's a good business model. So what um, I was going to ask you one or two more things about autism. What what was the baseline rate of autism when it first was discovered? Oh, know, it was very low, was. like one in 20,000, one in 10,000, maybe in 1970. Before glyphosate, I would say like one in 10,000. Today, it's yeah, like it one, one in 54. That's yeah, a it's a huge change. difference. And then yeah. they say, we're just diagnosing it more. It makes me laugh, although I cry at the same time. We're just diagnosing it more. One in 54. I mean. Pretty much everyone knows someone, I think, these days who either has autism or they, I mean, people know people with autism pretty commonly these days, which is really sad. Well, so what's what's ahead, do you think, in the next few years uh, in terms of understanding and hopefully getting rid of glyphosate? I keep hoping that the government's going to realize that they need to get rid of glyphosate for COVID-19. And I'm very frustrated that they're not, because I've been saying that. I've been shouting that to the rooftops, you know, if we, if we would just start eating healthy, we wouldn't have such a problem with COVID-19. And, uh, and, and it really frustrates me. The government never even mentions that idea. At least if they would say once, I would feel so much happier, you know, <laughs> that's all about social distancing and masking up and, you know, there's it's And of course, vaccines, which I think are terrible, but. <laughs> What's the best way for people to find out more about glyphosate and autism? 
Well, my book would be a great place to start because I have a lot of that. Autism is a major focus of the book, and I explain um, in detail how glyphosate is causing the autistic behaviors. That'd probably be the best place to start, and it has a lot of references. So, if you wanted to dig deeper, you could just look at look it up in the references. Okay, and for the layperson, it's understandable. It's not too technical, or it, I actually so. did work very hard, very hard. I spent a whole year writing and another year trying to make it simpler. So, it, it was a, a major effort on my part to make it more accessible to the layperson. So, I think so. I didn't entirely succeed, but I think a lot of people have said that if you look at the reviews of the book, a lot of people do say that it's um, it's written in friendly language for the novice. Did you, do you have an audiobook version of it? I do, yes. Oh, good. good. Now, that, to me, that makes them a lot more accessible, you know, because I like to, I'm very auditory, but yeah, so that's, that's good. good. I know a lot of science books, they don't have the audiobook version, and some of them are listed as textbooks, which no one makes, it makes no one read them. So right, I'm glad right. it's, it's yeah, this that, is yeah. intended for the general public. That was my intent. And it was hard to do that because, as you can tell from what I said today, there's a lot of biochemistry and biophysics in there. So it's uh, and I'm well, hoping so- it might attract people to biology because I find biology absolutely fascinating. It's been such a gift for me to be able to learn about biology. I'm still learning about biology and I just love it. It's so cool. And once you sort of break over that barrier you know, that it, that it, the literature can become accessible to you. It really opens a huge number of doors for you to expand your horizons and learn more about how life works because it is such a fascinating topic. Yeah, that's great. Well, Stephanie, thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, is there anything else you want listeners to know or, or is this good for now? Yeah, I did mention sunlight a couple of times. I just want to encourage people to get out in the sunlight without sunscreen, without uh, sunglasses, because I think that the sunlight is going to really help you to cope with COVID-19 should you catch it. I think it's a very important mm. part, uh, not just the vitamin D, but just uh, to help with your maintaining your energy levels in your body, and keeping you keeping keeping your immune system strong. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That was my pleasure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.